Well, hey there. Welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. Nobody cares. Work harder. And let me tell you a story about that before we begin. Oh my goodness. We this week had a team meeting. We have team meetings every single week on a Monday. And uh, my director of operations, Jamie, decided as a surprise to have our Nobody Cares Work Harder t-shirts delivered to the whole team and for them to wear them all in our team meeting. Because of course, we have a large worldwide team. So we're not always here in the office together. There's four of us who work in the office here in Belfast, but um, the rest of the team's all over the world. And in this particular meeting, I think there were about 15 people in the meeting and everybody was wearing wearing our new Nobody Cares Work Harder t-shirts. And of course, I didn't even notice because I was too busy chatting away and whatever. And then Christina, my COO, was like, "Uh, do you not do you not notice something came? And I was like, what? What what am I noticing? And then everybody stood up and I was like, oh my God, look at everybody. Like it was so delicious. Honestly, it was just wonderful. You've no idea. Um, And so I took a photo and I put it on my Instagram. And actually I'm going to put the photo in the show notes as well, because I think you guys would love to see it. Everybody was wearing the Nobody Cares Work Harder t-shirt. So if you too would like to get your hands on a tank, a t-shirt, you know, we have all kinds of apparel on our website, simply go to thesculptedvegan.com scroll down or go to the apparel tab and you will see nobody cares work harder on a t-shirt and actually everybody loves wearing it because it's such a great slogan so you know it's not like you know branded apparel where you're like okay I'm wearing this because the boss said I have to it's nobody cares work harder is actually a great slogan and you can pick up your t-shirt in the sculpted vegan or on the sculpted vegan website and I really hope you do and if you do wear your nobody cares work harder t-shirt then make sure you tag me on Instagram and I will reshare it to my page because I love resharing stuff and it really is like I want to have that the nobody cares work harder um, etched on my gravestone. Not even kidding. Um, so what are we going to talk about this week? Well, we're going to talk about um, buns and guns. No, well, we're kind of going to talk about buns and guns. Not not buns and guns as in the real buns and guns, but as in buns and guns, the eight-week program that we have just launched this week. Um, and it's been a very, uh, hmm, a very interesting week, let's say. It's been honestly quite stressful. Um, it's been exciting, it's been stressful, and I have definitely been guilty of the thing that I am going to teach today in more ways than one. And even as I'm actually just talking to you guys, I'm realizing that I've been guilty. This thing I'm going to, like, I am a work in progress. This thing I'm going to teach you today, I am still guilty of from realizing I thought I was perfect. Evidently not. Um, and so, yeah, so we launched Buns and Guns this week, and... Uh, simultaneously, uh, or simultaneously, as they say in America, iOS 14. Apple decided to release iOS 14, which uh, they have updated all of their privacy settings and Facebook shit the bed. And we, as you know, are dependent uh, on Facebook ads for, you know, our launches and to reach our, you know, new people with our programs. You know, we last year we spent a million pounds. So we spent $1.4 million on Facebook ads. Not even kidding. Okay. $1.4 million on Facebook ads, um, which was, you know, about a quarter of our revenue, uh, which is great. So we're only spending you know, a quarter of our revenue on advertising to bring in uh, new programs, but or new products and new new customers. <laughs> Can't even speak today. Uh, but um, buns, Facebook shit the bed because didn't know what to do with this new update. So we were launching like fifteen thousand pounds, twenty thousand dollars a day. <laughs> Don't even ask me why we were doing that much because Buns and Guns was supposed to be our biggest launch ever. So we uh, were were plowing that amount into Facebook ads, not really meant me able to manage the metrics of the Facebook ads inside Facebook because they were skewing the metrics because of the new privacy settings. So we were, you know, my Facebook ads manager, Vanessa, was managing them somewhere else, not realizing we were hemorrhaging money and the whole thing was a total shit show. So what has that even got to do with what I'm going to teach you today? <laughs> Well, um, I think that part of the problem is I had a, now don't get me wrong, we've sold 3,000 programs. So people are like, okay, Kevin, you're not actually doing too badly. I'm not going to feel sorry for you anymore. But my goal was 5,000 programs, okay? And I had kind of convinced myself that Buns and Guns was going to be our biggest launch ever. And I'd convinced myself that we were absolutely going to do 5,000 programs in a launch, even though the best launch we ever had was 3,300 programs. I was convinced we were going to sell 5,000 programs and this was going to be our biggest launch ever. And I had placed all my eggs in that basket. And then iOS 14 happened. And my 5,000 programs started to slip through the cracks and I fell into a deep, dark depression. Not really a deep, dark depression, but deep, dark depression, Kim style, which means 
I have found it hard to keep my state this week and I have been a little bit down about the whole thing and I didn't even plan to tell you all this on the podcast except I'm going to be completely transparent and tell you that I'm sitting in my office drinking whiskey. Not even kidding. So (laughs) you're like, okay, is she drunk or what the fuck's happening in this podcast? No, not drunk. Uh, Maybe by the end of the podcast because I'm sitting in... (laughs) I'm sitting in one of the offices uh, in my office um, drinking whiskey from a coffee cup. Why, pray tell? Because Rachel, who's my customer services manager, her husband works in the alcohol industry where he works for Jack Daniels. And he today, very sweetly, because he knows I've been under a lot of stress, um, delivered in the most delicious box of single malt whiskey, Scottish single malt whiskeys. And I was sitting at my desk here at 9.30, sorry, 7.30, Um, on a Wednesday night. It's the third night I've worked late in the office this week, alone. And I just decided to crank open the whiskey, pour myself a wee cup of it, and drink it while I was preparing the podcast. So here we go, taking a wee sip. Hang on, listen. (sighs) Did you hear that? (laughs) That was whiskey going down out of a coffee cup. (laughs) So anyway, um... (laughs) Buns and guns, successful, definitely had an expectation as to what it was going to be, did not hit that expectation. Would we have if Facebook hadn't shit the bed? Possibly, but you know what? Now we'll never know because reality is reality and you cannot make it any different than it is. So today we are going to talk about all things to do with that because here's what happened. Buns and guns launched as every single program that we launch does. And the Facebook group is filling up with people who are massively excited about the program, but you also get a massive amount of people who are just like me and who are a little OCD. There's no other way to describe it, a little bit OCD. And some are a lot a bit OCD, (laughs) like me. So understand, if you are in Buns and Guns and you're like, Oh, is she talking about me? I may be, but even if you are one of the crazy OCD fuckers that are in the group, (laughs) understand I am like you and every single successful person in the world has a massive dose of OCD. In fact, you cannot be successful or entrepreneurial or make a lot of money or successful at something you know, like even karate or or trail running or whatever, you cannot be massively successful if you do not have a little bit or a lot of bit of OCD. So if you have OCD, just understand that it's probably a really good thing, even though it doesn't appear good in the surface. So the buns and guns is filled with um, people who are stressing, stressing like crazy. It happens every single launch, stressing over the tiniest little minutia that really does not make sense in the grand scheme of things. And I know why they're stressing, because we have a $41,500 prize fund. $20,000 top prize, 10,000 second, 5,000 third, 3,000 fourth, 1,000 fifth, and $500 for each person who comes six to 10th, judged by a professional panel of bodybuilding judges. And I know that $20,000 really is a life-changing sum of money for many people. So I get why they're stressing. I get why the stress is there. But this podcast is really to help those of you who are going through buns and guns or anyone who's embarking on a fitness program, even if you're not in my competition. And by the way, it's not too late if you're listening to this before May 24th. It's not too late to join the competition. It starts May 24th. You could even start May 25th or May 26th or, or any time that week. So if you're listening to this before the end of May 2021, it's not too late to get in on the action. Buns and guns, simply go to our website, sculptedvegan.com. You'll see it there on the homepage. And you can get in on the action still, but I understand why people are stressing because it is a life-changing sum of money. But I wanted to make a podcast to tell you about how I have stressed in the past, why why we do stress, and really why you don't have to, and why it may even be counterproductive to what it is that you want to achieve. So that was that is what today's podcast is all about. And I can't believe that this very long-winded intro has taken me nine minutes. But you know what? I'm going to be honest, this whiskey is hitting my bloodstream and I'm beginning to feel good. So I have notes for this podcast and I have no idea if I'm going to follow them or not. In fact, they just this just may be called Kim's Whiskey Fueled Podcast. And if you like it and I get a little bit drunk and I start talking a lot of shit and you think it's fun, you can tell me in the reviews. And 
I'll maybe do more of them. In fact, it it may be, you know, the Nobody Cares Get Drunk podcast. And that's how we can rebrand in future. So um, let me just tell you before we get into the content that the uh, we announced the winner of the podcast last week. But if you want to win a copy of our, one of our Sculpted Vegan programs, including Buns and Guns, a brand new program, including the 18-month Sculpt and Shred program, which is a $1,500 program, then you absolutely 100% can. All you have to do is leave a review wherever you listen to this podcast, take a screenshot of the review and send it to me on Instagram. Let me tell you something, we only have each month about, let me see, maybe one a day. We maybe only have 20 reviews no, that, that there's not 20 days in a month, maybe 30 days in a month, not even one a day. I would say five a week. We maybe have 20 reviews each month of the podcast. So you have a really, really, really good chance of winning. There's not like thousands of people review it. So definitely take a review, or sorry, write a review of the podcast wherever you listen to it, take a screenshot, send it to me on Instagram at The Sculpted Vegan, and you could be in the chance of winning one of our programs. And uh, You don't even have to pay for it, and then I will shout you out in the podcast as well. Okay, so now that I have talked this very, very long-winded <laughs> introduction, I'm going to take another wee slug of my whiskey, and then we're going to get started into the content. Let's get into it. Um, so why do we obsess? over the tiny little details. Because like I said earlier, Buns and Guns launched, we have sold nearly 3000 programs. And (laughs) although we have some, you know, more experienced members in the group, and we have people who are new and who are just happy to wing it. We also have the subset of people who really are just making themselves unhappy. And it, it hurts my heart to see people stressing and making themselves unhappy because I know what that feels like. So my goal today is to alleviate a little bit of your pain and to make you feel a bit better. So in order to do that, let me start with a story because you know, I just love my stories. You know what we should call this podcast? We should call this story time with Kim. (laughs) Story time with Kim because all I do is tell fucking stories. Okay. So what happened to me or where did I first learn that this was not important or important or whatever? Uh, I remember whenever I first started training with Curtis, who was my first trainer, who actually incidentally is the ex-husband of the head trainer in my company, Laura. So Laura is a Sculpted Vegan head trainer. If any of you are in the groups or bought the programs, you will know Laura very, very well. Laura Hutchinson is her name. She actually used to be married to my first prep coach, Curtis, who I've talked about a lot in this podcast. So I started training with Curtis and I remember whenever I decided that I wanted to do a bikini competition, I of course became obsessed with looking at pictures of bikini competitors on the internet. So I would, you know, troll through websites, I would watch YouTube videos of bikini athletes, you know, on stage, I would watch Bikini Olympia reruns, I would go on Instagram and look up, you know, fitness models and and I was constantly, constantly striving to find pictures of the kind of body that I wanted to have because I didn't know what my body was capable of. I did not know what my body was was able to look like muscularly. I had never been super muscular before. I'd never competed on stage. I'd never been super ripped. So it's not like, you know, now I don't have a body goal now because my body is muscular. My body is actually, my body is amazing. I love my body. And it's very weird for me to be able to say that, but I truly, truly do love my body and love my physique. But in the beginning, of course, you know, I, many people get into bodybuilding because they don't like their body. And I really was not happy with how it looked. And so I started looking around Instagram at four pictures of inspiring fitness models that I could, you know, have on my phone or put on my computer or stick on the fridge or whatever that I could look at every day that would keep me going and keep me motivated whenever times got tough. And I remember one day going into the gym and I I had the previous night, I've been looking through Instagram and I had seen a couple of photos of bikini models that I really liked. Um, There was one particular one that popped up on my screen and her name was Camille Perriette. So um, Camille, um, Periat, P-E-R-I-A-T, I think it's spelled. So she was a Bikini Olympia model. And I remember looking at her body and it was, you know, obviously a Bikini Olympia um, stage shot. And I remember just thinking, oh 
my God, she is fucking amazing. Like, I just thought she was so muscular. And I've talked about her before in this podcast, because the funny thing is, I'm actually far more muscular than Camille is now. So, but I just thought she was like the epitome of muscularity and strength and beauty. And I just loved what she looked like. And I remember um, screenshotting the photo and I, I was so excited and I took it into Curtis the next day. And I said to him, I was like, look, look, I said, Curtis, I found a picture of what I'm going to look like. Now, I understand I didn't say I find a picture of what I want to look like. I find a picture of the kind of body I would love to have. I said to Curtis, I have found a picture of what I'm going to look like. And Curtis was like, oh, really? Show me. And so I showed him the picture. And I remember expecting him to go, yes, great goal. Absolutely. That's exactly what you should be aiming for. You're you're definitely, I'm going to be able to get you there. That's what I wanted to hear from Curtis. Yes, I'm going to be able to get you there. And Curtis looked at it and he went, hmm, yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, but you know, it, it, I remember the first thing he said was, uh, yeah, but that's, that's a very American show. Like they have a very different standard to hear. And I was like, uh, but yeah, but but that's what I want to look like. And he was like, yeah, but like the shows over here, if you look like that, you'd be kicked out of the category. She's far too lean. You know, there's over here, there's, you know, there definitely girls aren't as lean as that and whatever. And I remember thinking, oh my God, he's so negative. Like, why is he so negative? Why can't he just say, yes, Kim, I can do that for you. That's a great goal. You're going to get there. All I wanted to hear was positivity, right? But women need to hear positivity and encouragement. Men don't do positivity and encouragement. Men do reality. Okay, men do reality. That's what they do. So Curtis, um, so Curtis was like definitely not very reality based. And I remember being like really disappointed that he wasn't ex as excited about this photo as I was. And I remember thinking internally, "Oh, just you wait. I'll show you." I was so defiant, right? So I was like, "I'll show you. Just you wait." And uh, and I would bring Curtis in these photos all the time, and I would say, "Look, look, Curtis, look, I, I want a bum like this." And I remember bringing him in a picture of Anala Sagra. Okay. This uh, online, this this model online, and I showed him Anella's photo. And Lella, her name is. I showed him her photo. And I was like, I, I want to have a bum like this. And he was like, Kim, she's about fucking twelve, right? She wasn't twelve. She's was about twenty one. And he goes, like, she's twelve. And I was like, Yeah, but I want I want a bum like that. And he was like, Kim, it's physically impossible for you to have a bum like that. You're thirty seven. And I remember being like. Why, why is he being so negative all the time? Why isn't he just saying to me, yes, Kim, anything is possible, Kim. I believe in you, Kim. No. And then I remember showing him another girl's photo. They, like these significant moments stick out in my mind. I showed him this other girl's photo and he was like, and he was like, and I showed him this. I was like, oh, look at her glutes. I want to have glutes like that. And he goes, yeah, she's obviously been training a long time. And I was like, fuck me. Why so negative? I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to hear, yes, I can make your butt look like that in eight weeks, Kim. Like you're going to look like that in 12 weeks. You stick with me and you'll have a butt like that. But all I was hearing, it seemed was negativity, negativity, negativity. No, well, here's the thing. I wasn't hearing fucking negativity. I was hearing reality because Curtis had been training for a long time and he had trained a lot of bikini athletes and he had he had competed himself in bikini, in bodybuilding shows and he'd been studying athletes looking at athletes he knew who was going to win who wasn't going to win who had the best physique how long it took he knew what it you know everything about bodybuilding and I knew absolutely nothing so what I would have been better to do was say oh interesting Curtis does not think that this is possible why is that? Let's get a little more data because getting more data from someone who was more experienced than me would have actually helped me in my quest to have a better body. But of course, I was so narcissistic. It's a very female thing to do, by the way, okay? Not putting down my sex, but we generally believe that whatever we decide to be true will be true. That's, that's the way females are. And so I had decided that I was going to look like this, be like this, or whatever, do like this. And I had, I was very annoyed that Curtis just was not, you know, buying into my vision. But really, if I had listened to him, I probably would have got there a little bit quicker. But, you know, and I thought that he just didn't believe in me. And I really just decided to prove him wrong. So <laughs> what am I trying to say here? Well, if you're anything like me, okay, and this is, this is why I was the way that I was. I hate the unknown, I hate the unknown. I'm getting better with it as I get older. I still hate it, but I've learned to accept it because the unknown is the unknown. Like at the minute, like I said at the very beginning, my business has been thrown into a precarious position because of 
I was about to say coronavirus, but no, that was last year. Coronavirus fucked me over last year and threw me into a precarious position. This year, it's Apple, right? I love Apple, but dear God, Apple has completely thrown me into a precarious position and fucked my business. And so now I find myself in the unknown and I've learned to accept it. I'm like, this too shall pass. We have all these different things in place in order to grow. It's not the end of the world. But you know what? It's a shitty place to be. I hate the unknown because I am a very resourceful person and I can usually make things happen, okay? I I can make things happen, I can get out of situations, and I can usually get whatever it is that I set my mind to. That is the way I always was as a child. Whatever I set my mind to, I could make happen. I got myself into some sh- terribly sticky situations when I was a teenager, and I always managed to get myself out. So, but here's the thing, okay? With bodybuilding, you cannot make the body build faster than it can build. You cannot force your body to build more muscle than it is capable of building in a short and in a faster amount of time. You cannot burn fat faster than the body can burn it. You cannot build muscle faster than the body can build it. You cannot force recovery. You cannot force your body to get better from a sickness or an illness any more, any faster than it can go. And I know that the control freaks amongst you are listening to this going, Really? You know, the, you know, those of you, not well, maybe not anyone who listens to this podcast, but other people, the other people, you know, people who get a cold and the minute they feel a cold coming on, they go, oh, I'm going to double up my echinacea and my vitamin C and I'm taking Epsom salts baths and I'm loading up with magnesium. And they kind of think that if they just overload the body with goodness in some way, it'll counteract the badness and it'll like ward off the cold. And God forbid they ever think they're getting a cold. And then they take all the echinacea and the vitamin C and the magnesium and the whatever. And then the cold doesn't happen. They go, see, that was me. That was all of those vitamins that I took. I was able to ward off that cold. And I'm kind of like, well, yeah, maybe, but probably not. Probably your cold just wasn't as bad as you thought it was in the first place. And now you have cognitive dissonance because you're slanting data to make it seem that, you know, what you did caused it to not be the way it is. And you're probably not correct, but that's fine. I'll let you have the hypothesis. That's okay. So (laughs) um, if you're still with me, definitely this should be called Nobody Cares Drink More podcast. Um, If you're still with me, what I'm trying to tell you is that those of you who are like me, um, maybe not you listening to this podcast, but the other people, you cannot force things to be the way you want them to be. You cannot make things happen faster than they can happen. And just because you believe something to be true doesn't actually mean that it's true or that it will be true. And bodybuilding teaches you reality. It teaches you what is possible in reality. And that is why it's so grinding. That is why bodybuilding, I believe, everybody should do bodybuilding because it teaches you patience, consistency, and discipline. My my kids who are 15, 14, 11, and nine all do PT sessions every week, personal training sessions every week. We have a home gym, which we built in our dining room, but now our brand new home gym, which is getting fully kitted out tomorrow, is going to be ready this week. And the kids are going to be able to train properly in in our proper home gym every week with their PT. The reason why I have the kids training twice a week, and I I don't force them to, they enjoy it, they want to do it, is because learning how long it takes to do something as a child is such an incredible skill that you can teach your children that they will carry into adulthood, that they they will learn persistence, they will learn discipline, they will learn consistency, they will learn focus. But more than anything, they will learn that little bits of effort consistently over time is what creates incredible results. Not going hell for leather, and trying to force it to be the way you want it to be, whether it's a cold you're trying to overcome with echinacea, echinacea, echinacea even, (laughs) and vitamin C, or whether it's an eight-week shred that you've decided that you are going to lose 60 pounds and build 20 pounds of muscle or whatever, some other out-of-reality goal you've decided you're going to get. You know, you cannot force things to happen faster than you can force them to happen. And that is why bodybuilding is so grinding. And I guess that's what Curtis, my first trainer, was really trying to teach me by not buying into my shit, by not being like, oh yeah, it's so amazing, it's so great, or whatever. He wanted to give me a dose of reality. He didn't want me to be invested in something that I, 
you know, that was out of reality. So then, and then I would get disappointed. And probably he thought I would blame him if he said, absolutely, yes, this is possible. He probably then thought I would blame him. So he didn't want to, he didn't want to discourage me, but he didn't want to encourage me in my fantasy either. And that's kind of the way I run my business in Sculpted Vegan. You know, I'm very reality based with people. They say to me, oh, Kim, you know, I want to blah, blah, blah. And I go, sweetheart, that's never going to happen. And they go, really? And I'm like, no, 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 no. And I go, if you think that's going to happen or you want that, don't join this program. They're like, you're the first trainer that's ever tried to discourage me from buying your programs. I'm like, I'm not here to make money off you. I'm here to get you results. Okay. And if you think that you're going to, you're going to lose 60 pounds in four months, you're absolutely not. It's going to take you a year to lose that amount of weight. They're like, a year? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> Like, I'm not here to pull the wool over your eyes. I'm not here to sell you something. I'm here to give you reality data so you get results. And that's what Curtis, I think, was trying to do to me. And so, but <laughs> I didn't really see this at the time. All I saw that he was being a bit of a negative Nelly because I was so focused on getting the results and doing the best that I could do. I, I, I kind of went a wee bit overboard, I have to be honest. I went a wee bit. So so he, here's kind of what happened, right? So I started prepping for my first show and I became obsessed with getting it right. And I mean obsessed, <laughs> obsessed with getting it right, okay? Now, as I've spoken about, Curtis's wife, Laura, was a, who is now my head trainer in Team Sculpted Vegan. Isn't that funny how things happen? So uh, Laura was my head trainer. She was, sorry, she's my head trainer now in Team Sculpted Vegan, but she was Curtis's girlfriend and they, fiance, and then they got married shortly afterwards um, at the time. And she is an incredible posing coach, okay? An incredible posing coach for bodybuilding shows. And so whenever I was... Um, training for this first show that I was doing and we'd set a date. We knew when we were going to do the first show. And Curtis would say to me, he'd said to me, um, you know, I've booked Laura in to give you some posing lessons. And I was like, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm not going to go to Laura. <laughs> Laura, little Laura for posing lessons. Laura would not be good enough for me. I I have booked Natalia Mello for posing lessons. Now, Natalia Mello is phenomenal. She's one of my best friends. I adore her. She is, but she is a former bikini Olympia champion. And she had won the Olympia, which is the most prestigious bodybuilding show that exists in the planet, on the planet. And she had won the bikini Olympia and she was living... <laughs> in Belfast, my hometown. In fact, she was living 10 minutes from my house and trained in the gym where I was training. So, or my family gym where we were a member of, not the gym I was training with Curtis. So I contacted uh, Natalia and I said to her, you know, my show is in, yeah, I think it was like 12 weeks. And I said, I'd, or 14 weeks or something. I said, I'd really love to get posing lessons from you. Would that be okay? And she was like, yes, absolutely. But you know, my rate is 125 pounds an hour, which is about $150 an hour. And I was like, oh, shit. Like at the time, that was a massive amount of money for me. So I was like, oh my God, you know, that's a shitload of money. Now, Laura was like 30 pounds an hour. <laughs> so, but I was like, oh no, Laura would not be good enough for me. So I decided I would book Natalia Mello. And really, I decided that I would book Natalia because I just was convinced that if I got everything perfectly right, that I would stand on stage looking like Camille Perriette. I had this vision in my mind of this ripped, goddess and uh, who I believe was a goddess at the time. And I just believed if I, if I did everything right, that I would stand on stage looking like her. And so I paid Natalia an absolute fortune at the time. My company was brand new. I really wasn't making a, that much money at the time, but I invested a huge amount of money in Natalia. I invested a huge amount of money in supplements. I researched every single possible supplement that would help me to burn fat, build muscle, preserve muscle tissue, all the rest of it. I, I set timers on my phone. I, you know, for taking my supplements, I was very considered and measured with everything. I ate a, the same food day in, day out for weeks and weeks and weeks on end because I, these were the foods that, that I had decided as a vegan bodybuilder would get me the best results. I measured everything. I measured my sleep. I measured my calories. I measured like I, I went crazy abs, like trying to trying to literally control every single tiny part of my prep. I was convinced that if I could just get exactly the right tan, I remember I shaved my entire body from head to toe. 
I'm not even joking. I shaved my entire body from head to toe because I was convinced that if I just shaved my entire body from head to toe, my skin would have a different sheen and my tan would shimmer under the lights. And maybe that beautiful tan and that skin with a sheen would 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 help would would make the judges go, oh wow, she sparkles, and I would wow them with my sparkle, and they would give me a better result. No, that's not how it works. The judges don't really give a shit how much your skin is sparkling. They're looking at who has the best physique, okay? There is no way that you can manipulate, wow, or change the judges in a bodybuilding competition. It doesn't really matter what your tan looks like, what your bikini looks like. As long as your bikini is acceptable for your show, as long as it sparkles a little bit, as long as your tan is the right color for your skin, as long as your hair looks good enough, as long as your makeup looks nice, they're not going to award you any more points because of your makeup. They are looking at what is the symmetry of your body? How lean are you? Do you have a glute ham tie-in? Do you have a nice delt cap? Do you have no visible abs? Do you, are you not so lean? You have striations. They have very particular categories or you know classifications that they're looking at. And those are nothing to do with your hair, your makeup, you know, whatever. Yes, your posing is important, but all these little things really just don't matter in the grand scheme of things because that's not what the bodybuilding judges are looking for. But of course, I was such a control freak and I was not prepared to be a beginner and I had such a massive fear of failure that I went hell for leather trying to control every single tiny variable. Every single tiny variable controlled to within an inch of its life, not realizing but if I had just relaxed and just worked a bit harder, figured out how to do a bit more cardio or figured out how to eat a little less fat or just an, an, or lift a little more weight, if I had just really focused on the three variables, which was consistency of diet, consistency of heavy lifting and consistency of cardio, that that is all I needed to get really good results. And all of the tiny little minutia that I was focusing on really didn't matter and really was not going to affect the outcome. And so what happened was, you know, I didn't go to Laura for for, po for posing coaching and I wish that I had of because she's a phenomenal coach. And Natalia was good, but actually Natalia had co Natalia coached me very much. Um, Natalia hadn't competed for quite a few years and she coached me very much on the American way of posing, whereas Laura actually understood the local shows that I was competing in. She understood the category. She understood what the judges were looking for. And she would have been a local coach who understood the shows and who coached other competitors locally would have been a much better choice than Natalia. And Natalia was great, but Laura probably would have been able, she was more relevant in terms of um, an experience in the shows that I was doing. And that would have been a better choice for me at the time. But, you know, of course, I, I didn't think of all this. I just thought that if I could control all the variables and choose and, and do the very, very, very best that I could do, I would get a better result. But really, it's absolutely not true. So why, why was I like this? Because I'm a control freak and control freaks need to believe or need to feel that we can influence and control the outcome. And this is because we need to close the loop, right? We And what do I mean by closing the loop? But, well, we believe that if we can just get every single thing perfect, then somehow things will be better or somehow we can control the outcome. But really what this stems from or what drives this is it's just a fear over a lack of data. Control freaks hate a lack of data. I hate a lack of data. I have become, I have come to accept it now as I've moved through bodybuilding and business building. And I've realized that that a lack of data is simply is simply what we live with every day as human beings. And the more you risk and the more you take chances and the more you push in your life, the 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 less data you have. So control um control freaks love to have a they hate a lack of data and they they usually keep everything in their lives very measured, very considered and very consistent. Control freaks hate change. Okay. We hate massive change and we like everything to stay the same. And so what happens is we, we, we become, 
we have such an internal conflict going on, right? This this fear that we have, this lack of data that we have, or this fear over, the fear really is a lack of data, but this fear that we have that drives us, we're constantly trying to control the fear. And so because we don't want, just want to sit and go, hmm, interesting, I'm feeling quite fearful, or that scares the shit out of me, or I'm really not sure what to expect because we we have all that going on or because we, we're not willing to do that, sorry, and we have all this fear, this feeling of fear welling up inside of us, what do we do to control the fear? Well, we control our external environment. We actually believe, or it's not even that we believe, it. controlling your external environment gives you a sense of peace, a sense of internal peace, a sense of calm on the inside. And how this is actually most often demonstrated is in people who become um, obsessive over cleaning their house. Now, I want to ask you, have you ever felt really upset about something and or you've had a fight with your husband or maybe you've gone through a breakup or a divorce or a fight with your best friend or maybe you have moved into a new apartment and you're feeling scared or you've moved to a, a new country or something, but something in your, um, something has changed where your internal environment is turbulent. You're feeling upset, you're feeling sad, you're feeling scared. What do you do? You start to tidy. Or maybe you're feeling angry, right? Maybe you're you're premenstrual and therefore you, and you're angry with your husband or you're pissed off with your kids or you're just pissed off in general and you don't know why. What do we start to do? We start to clean, don't we? We start to clean. We start to tidy, clean. That cupboard needs reorganized. That entire pantry is a fucking mess. I do not know how I did not notice this before. All of those, all of those cans need to be in alphabetical order. And I need to go and get my labeling machine. And I need to label every fucking thing in that cupboard because why in God's name is it not labeled? Because the disorganization is driving me insane. So we organize the pantry cupboard and then we realize that the laundry is is piling up and it needs folded. So we, we, we fold it and then look how dirty that floor is. And those cushions, why are those cushions a mess? And our kids are like, holy God, well, you need to get out of the way of mom. And your husband's like, shit, let's go off and play golf for the day because you are like a whirling dervish around your house cleaning it because you mistakenly believe or don't even realize that it's happening that you, we think that if we control our external environment, that we can control our internal environment. We don't realize we're feeling fearful and turbulent. We're out of cause. We're not, we're not self-aware enough to realize, oh shit, I'm feeling a wee bit turbulent on the inside. So what I need to do now is I need to sit with the feeling and accept that it's going to be this way and that it's all right to feel sad or scared or upset. And these are perfectly normal feelings, but we don't know to do that. We don't even quite often know we're feeling bad. So we go into hyper control the external environment mode in, in, a, in a quest or a bid to calm our internal environment. And that's exactly why we do it. Um, and I was like, Okay, well, suddenly I was like, oh shit, hang on, was there something else we're going to say about that, about notes? But I just glanced at my notes there, but that, that's exactly why we do it. We want to control our internal environment. And so that's what I believed whenever I went into hyper control mode over competing in my first show. I thought that if I could just control the posing, I could go to the best posing coach and if I could control the food, control the supplements, if I could control every single tiny variable, if I could watch and watch and watch and watch and watch, obsessively watch bikini shows, if I could just nail that back pose, if I could just do this, if I could just do that. I, I wanted to try and, and, and find perfection in as many possible variables as I could, because I believe that finding per per perfection on the outside would cause me to feel calm on the inside. But it's actually simply not true. And I'm sorry if I'm devastating you by saying that, but it's actually not true. It does, controlling our external environment temporarily causes us to feel better on the inside. But what actually causes you to feel better on the inside is to acknowledge that you're just having a massive fear over a lack of data and that it's normal and that you just need to sit with the feeling and not worry about it and not indulge it and not try to take it away because it's normal and everybody feels it. Um, 
And so if you are this kind of person who obsessively cleans your house or cleans your car or folds laundry or whatever else that it is that you do to comfort yourself, whenever you're feeling turbulent or upset or fearful or sad or whatever those emotions are, you, you got to recognize that, yes, it is okay. And it is great to get your house cleaned, of course. But what is better is to acknowledge that you're having the feelings and not pretend that they don't exist and not try to obsessively control the external environment because that actually, at the end of the day, just makes you, it just makes you feel worse. And you really can't control what happens on the outside. Yes, you can influence it. Yes, you can give it your best shot. Yes, you can show up consistently. Yes, you can work towards the best possible outcome. But you have to understand that everything you're doing is a hypothesis. Everything you're doing is a hypothesis if you've never done it before. And well, even if you have done it before, done it before, every experience is a new hypothesis. Like I am on a adverted commas, shred at the minute. I'm not shredding for a show. I'm not shredding for anything in particular, except that it's nearly summer and I'm starting to wear a bikini and I've decided that I wanted to be a little bit leaner for wearing a bikini um, uh, because I love to show off this body that I've worked really hard for. So I started to cut calories about eight weeks ago and I started to increase cardio as where I could and I I cut back on alcohol where I wanted to and um, I was, as she says, sitting in her office drinking whiskey. And I, you know, I, I decided to manipulate some variables that I'm not going to the gym anymore because I'm training from home. So that's completely new variables. So, but I have enough experience to know that if I eat a little less and do a little more cardio and stay consistent in those two variables that my body will drop fat. And I have dropped, um, I stood on the scales the other day, I've dropped about four pounds of fat, which is a lot for me because uh, I'm very lean anyway. I'm probably sitting at about 13 to 14% body fat currently. And I, you know, it's consistently coming off, but it's still a hypothesis because I've never, I've never done it this way before. But what I do know, even though I'm hypothesizing what is going to happen at the end of the shred, I don't really have any particular goal for it other than to look leaner. Um, I do know that really the only two variables I need to manipulate are my cardio and my calories. And if I just stay consistent with those two variables over a longer per a long period of time, whether that be at least eight weeks, so eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16, 20 weeks, that my body will change dramatically. And I know that if I stall in my changes, then I can just drop my calories a little more. I can increase my cardio a little more and that will kickstart my metabolism into burning more fat. But how do I know this to happen? How can I shred in such a relaxed manner? Because I've done it many, 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 many times. So I know now that managing the minutia, that managing the tiny little variables does not matter and does not get you any better results because I've done it both ways. I've manipulated every single tiny little variable and I've done it the other way where I have been very relaxed in my shred and both times I've ended up with the same result. And this reminds me actually of whenever Corey was born, my first son, he was 15. And I, again, I'm the kind of person who hates a lack of data. And I was pregnant with this little boy very suddenly. I wasn't planning on being pregnant. Ryan and I had only known each other two weeks. And I found, found out that I was pregnant a few months afterwards. Um, I was very happy to be pregnant because I, I knew that Ryan was the man I wanted to spend my life with. And so I found out I was pregnant. And as I got fatter and fatter, I remember... My my sister had had a baby at the time, so she had my my niece Lauren in March, and Corey was due in November. And I remember she'd really struggled after she'd had Lauren. She was struggling with getting her to sleep through the night, and she was struggling with nap times. and And I remember just thinking, God, this whole baby thing sounds horrendous. And I remember she she said then she found this book. It was called by a woman called Gina Ford, and it was a book called The Contented Little Baby Book. And this book has caused a lot of controversy because people either detest Gina Ford or they love her. She's like Marmite. They either think she's the worst thing that ever happened to children all over the world, or they think she's the best thing that ever happened to children. The control freaks love her. The baby wearing kumbaya, co-sleeping moms hate her. And I've been on both sides. I've been on the controlling side and I've been on this baby wearing co-sleeping kumbaya mother. And I've kind of settled somewhere in the middle, to be honest. So what happened was Carol had given me this book and she'd said, this book will be your Bible. 
read it from cover to cover, and it will tell you exactly what to do. It is the baby manual. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, I thought I'm not really there. I kind of skimmed through it. Yeah, it seems I was like, it's none of it's really relevant to me. You know, it's not about babies. I actually have a baby yet. I have a big fat tummy. So I didn't really think about it. And then as the birth drew closer and closer and I got fatter and fatter and I knew this baby was going to pop out at some point, I thought, I turned to the Gina Ford Contented Baby Book and I thought, hmm, maybe it's time to read this. And as I, of course, I was giving birth like in a couple of weeks. So as I began to read this, I realized that Gina Ford in her book gave you very specific routines for your baby. Wake baby at 7 a.m. Feed baby from right breast for 25 minutes. Move baby to left breast for 10 minutes. Express milk to keep up milk supply. So she had all these very specific ways of doing things. You know, baby, your you, your baby will go through a growth spurt at three weeks and six weeks and nine weeks. So you started expressing milk in the beginning so that you... Um, had enough milk for the baby to go through a growth spurt. You didn't have to, you know, keep feeding and feeding and have a disruption in the schedule. So everything to do that Gina Ford taught was about keeping your baby on a very specific schedule because um, it then it gave you more peace of mind. It kept the baby more content and happy. It eliminated colic and, and usually reflux and stuff like that. And so therefore, um, I and uh, the control freak in me, as soon as I read this, I was like, this is incredible. This is a baby manual. The, all I have to do is follow this and I will have a perfectly contented baby. And so I brought this book to hospital and I, whenever I, because I had Corey in hospital, I had the rest, I had home births with the rest of them. But with Corey, I had a private consultant and I had him in hospital. I remember bringing it to hospital and the midwives saying to me, um, oh, you're not actually going to follow that book, are you? And I was like, oh yes, this book is amazing. Like it is uh, from from day one, literally from Corey is born, I'm going to, I'm going to fit him into these, you know, feeding and sleeping routines. And they were like, well, maybe give it a couple of days. I was like, oh no, 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 you don't understand. This is like, this is the manual for, like, for having a baby. You, you obviously, just, I, just, I was total know-it-all. I just thought I've never had one of these things before, but I definitely know better than these midwives because I've read the Contented Baby Book, God damn it. So, Anyway, um, Corey came along and that was fine. And I got him home. And of course, literally within a couple of days, I was like, right, must follow the book, must follow the book. And I completely ignored my instincts, which was, so why not just keep the baby with you in bed and, you know, do what animals do and feed them when they're hungry and co-sleep with them and sleep with the baby sleeping because rest is important. But no, 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 no. I was determined that I was going to fit Corey into this sleeping manual into this feeding sleeping manual and it was going to be fine. And of course, you know, nothing went to fucking plan because Corey was not a robot. He was a baby. And as much as I tried to goddamn well fit him into these routines, it worked, you know, a lot of the times actually did work. You woke up at certain times and then he was hungry and you fed him and he, he never had any, you know, reflux, none of my babies had any feeding problems or reflux problems or, you know, colic problems or anything like that. But, you know, he was a baby and he was unpredictable. And at times he would waken during nap time when he wasn't supposed to. And and so there were all these things that, you know, all these variables that would change and I didn't know how to deal with them and I didn't know what to do. And, and I was winging it. And I was just, I just remember thinking I was determined to try to get him to sleep through the night. And honestly, there was a part of me was like, prideful about it. I was like, I want to have the kind of baby who sleeps through the night from like eight weeks. And I kept hearing of all these bottle fed babies who were like, you know, sleeping through the night from like four weeks and five weeks. And I'm like, really? Your baby's sleeping from midnight till 7 p 7 a.m. like at four weeks? Are you fucking serious? Because, you know, I was still up feeding through the night. And of course I thought I was doing something wrong because the book said, like seriously, the book said that if I did everything right, that my baby would sleep through the night by 12 weeks. In fact, it almost promised it. And so we were creeping towards 12 weeks, but it was like, we were getting to about eight weeks and I've always been an overachiever, right? Always been an overachiever. So I thought, I am going to make this baby sleep through the night by maybe six weeks or eight weeks. And I was, it was like, I was waiting and waiting and waiting. I don't know why sleeping through the night was like the holy grail of babies. There's a lot of pride, I think, in mothers about sleeping through the night. So it was the holy grail of babies. And I was working and working and working towards this. And I remember just thinking, if only I could get him to follow the routine perfectly. Perfectly. It's obviously following the routine perfectly. That is what causes the baby to sleep through the night. So I was like, if I can just make him to follow the routine perfectly, he will sleep through the night. And I remember one day, one day I was like, right, today 
is the day because it was very easy to wake up in the morning at 7 a.m. You're fucking knackered, right? Because you've been feeding all night and the day is long and boring when you have a very young baby. So really, when your baby falls back to sleep early in the morning, you know what you want to do? Go back to sleep too. Would I let myself? No. So I, this particular morning, I was like, right, no, 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 we're up, we're up. 6.45, woke the baby, fed him his first feed. I, sl- I always co-slept, by the way. I was like, no, it just doesn't feel right to put him in a cot or put him in a crib. You know, it's like, no, 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 he sleeps with me. Ryan, you're out. Ryan was out relegated to the spare room and Corey slept with me. So I woke him at 6.45, fed him, expressed from one breast, fed him from the other breast, got him down for his nap, woke him from his nap, fed him again, he did, did everything correctly. And I remember thinking, oh my God, this is amazing. He slept, like he, he did his nap in the morning. He did two and a half hour nap at lunchtime. He had a short sleep in the afternoon. It was bath time, bedtime. And he then, he went to bed and he slept right through till like 9.30 or 10. And I woke him at 10 and I fed him and, and I fed him really well. And then I put him back down and I was like, I was like literally going to bed doing the happy dance. I was like, oh my God, I stayed on schedule all all day. I fit him into exactly the right schedule. And and tonight is the night. Tonight is the night. He's going to sleep through the night. And I was like so excited. And I went to bed and I put my head on the pillow and I had a big smile on my face. And about an hour later, I heard, and I was like, no, 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 no. I was disgusted. I remember being like, what the actual fuck? I did everything perfectly. I did everything the book told me to do. Why is that baby awake? And I lay there going, no, no, I'm just going to ignore him. And of course, my mother and was going, your baby's crying. Hello, you can't ignore him. And the other side of me is going, no, 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 he cannot possibly be hungry because I followed the book to the letter. And I lay there for about what seemed like half, half an hour. It was probably 30 seconds <laughs> listening to him cry. And then I picked him up. And I fed him. And I realized in that moment that it didn't matter what the book said. Didn't matter <laughs> whether, didn't matter if I followed the routine perfectly. Didn't matter if I got him down for a nap and woke him from a nap and fed him from one breast for 25 minutes and the other breast for 10 minutes. And that his bath was perfect and his bedtime was perfect and his pajamas were comfortable and I did everything right. Didn't none of it mattered because getting it perfect did not guarantee results, which is actually what I had told myself would happen. I was like, if I just get it perfect, then I can guarantee results. And actually, it's not true. <laughs> and I realized in that moment that there, I could, all I could do, as I lay there in bed, I realized all I could do was do the best that I could do. All I could do was my best. I could give it my best shot but my best shot did not guarantee an outcome. And following a plan to the letter did not guarantee an outcome. Nothing guaranteed an outcome, nothing. Because everything we do is a hypothesis. And it was literally a life-changing moment for me. And from that moment on, I relaxed. Don't get me wrong, I'm still a bit of a crazy bitch, okay? Still am, to be honest, <laughs> even though Corey's now 15. Um, but I I relaxed from that moment on because I truly had believed that I, the reason why my son was not sleeping through the night was because I was a failure. I was failing. I was failing to do what I was told because I had a mistaken belief that if I just did as I would was told, everything would be different. And it wasn't true. And it's never true. And if you are competing in buns and guns and listening to this podcast, and you are feeling the way I was feeling when I had Corey, that if you could just find out exactly how many milliliters are in a UK tablespoon, then you will win the competition and get the $20,000. I'm here to tell you it's not true. Because that's the kind of crazy shit that people obsess over in the groups. They go, it says a handful of basil. How big is a handful? Because my hand is quite big, but yet someone else's hand may be quite small. And my, you know, what if my handful is is 30 grams, but her handful is 20 grams? Is that going to affect my results? No, because basil is a free food and it's not going to affect your results. Or they they say, um, but but it says cups. Is that a UK cup or is that a is that an American cup? Or 
or is that a, is that a an, a an Australian cup? Because all of the cups have different measurements, and it says it says a cup of water or a cup of plant milk. And there's 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 thirty four calories in a in a cup of American plant milk. But what if there's only thirty two calories in a cup of of UK plant milk? And therefore, I am eating an extra twelve calories per day. And those 12 calories per day will actually add up over the course of a week to an extra 70 or 90 calories a week. And those extra 90 calories a week are going to stop me from winning the 20 grand. No, 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 they're not. And then we have, um, I get up at, I, I, I have to be up for work at 4 a.m. I have to be in work, in work for 4 a.m., which means I get up at 3 a.m., which means that I cannot get up at 2 a.m. to do my cardio. So the only time I can do my cardio is when I get home from work at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. But if, but if I get home at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, I'm usually so starving that I have to eat before I do my cardio. And is this going to completely wreck my results? Because what if I have to eat before I do my cardio? Because Kim says we have to do fasted cardio. And if we have to do fasted cardio, well, then there's obviously a reason we have to do fasted cardio, because that means I'm going to burn three and a half more calories per hour, which if you add that up over a 12 week period or an eight week period, it's going to be a very large amount of calories. And so do you think that eating before my cardio in the afternoon is actually going to cause me to not win the $20,000? I'm not going to get best results. No, no, it's not. <laughs> eating before your cardio or eating after your cardio or not eating at all or, or eating all of your meals in one day or, or, or splitting your cardio into four sessions instead of two or one session instead of two or two sessions that were maybe not perfect and slightly shorter, or maybe your heart rate was 135 and it should have been 130, or maybe, God forbid, it was 115 for 15 minutes of your cardio when it should have been 120. Or maybe you had, you know, you had 22 blueberries instead of 20 in your porridge one morning because you thought that you were allowed 70 grams of porridge or 70 grams of blueberries because you were, you know, because you, you misread the PDF because you were tired. And what about if those extra 20 grams of blueberries are going to really make a, a long-term difference to your progress. But, you know, or what if you can't find creatine in your area, but you can find BCAA, but you can't find the BCAA that's recommended in the program. So your BCAA, you you reckon, you've realized that the scoop in your BCAA was actually larger than the scoop in the BCAA in the program. And you've been taking 20 grams of the BCAA instead of 15 grams. And is that going to affect your progress? No. <laughs> the answer is no. So this is the kind of, this is the kind of stuff that happens in so inside a, a shred. And I, I just want to say that I understand, okay? And hopefully you don't feel like, well, I'm just pissed off with her now because actually <laughs> now she's mocking me. Understand I'm not mocking you. What I'm saying is I was you. I am you for fuck's sake, right? I do this too, even now. Not with shredding, but I do do it with other things. But, you know, I'm here to tell you that whether you had 72 grams of blueberries instead of 70 or whether you had 22 mils of plant milk instead of 17 or whether you, you you fucked up one day and you had a larger portion of porridge than you were supposed to or you you only managed 55 minutes of cardio instead of 60 or your heart rate was 115 instead of 120 or all those tiny, tiny variables that you think are going to make a massive difference to your progress, they're not. What will make a massive difference to your progress is if you stick to the program consistently. You follow the diet consistently. You do your cardio consistently. That is what is going to give you incredible results on this or on any other program. Always aim to do more than is in the program. The winner of the Jailhouse Shred program, the, the male portion of the Jailhouse Shred program was a guy called Marlon. And when I interviewed him for the podcast, Marlon said that he he committed to doing more than the program said every single day. He said he got up every morning and he put his workout clothes beside his bed and he rolled out of bed and he went for a five kilometer run every morning before he did the program. And the program had two hours of cardio per day plus training. So he did an extra five kilometer run per day on top of the program. And Marlon won. He won the competition. He won $5,000. We split the, the, the prize money between two people. He won $5,000 because Marlon said, well, if this is, if the, I'm going to do the minimum, if this is what she said is going to get me phenomenal results, I'm going to do more than this because I know that doing more is going to get me better results. And that is what Marlon did. That is what all the winners do. The winners of all of our shred programs do not cheat on the diet. They sit down with the pen and paper. They sit down with the PDF. They go through it with a fine tooth comb. They prep their meals. They put in the work and they get the results. 
The winners don't stress. The winners don't stress about the variables. Let me tell you something. See the people who stress about the tiny minutia of the programs? They never, ever win. In fact, they don't even get into the top 10. The people who stress are usually the ones who don't remain consistent. They're the ones who have an inter, a turbulent internal environment and they believe that if they just control the external environment, they believe that if they just get everything right, that they will get have a better shot at winning. But unfortunately, their obsession over the minutia is the thing that stops them from winning because they miss the point. They miss the point. The point is, Follow the nutrition. Focus your efforts into meal prepping, planning, and following the nutrition exactly as laid out. Don't obsess over things that do not need to be obsessed over. You're just distracting yourself from doing the hard thing. For you, it's easy to stress over the tiny details. It's easy to get yourself caught up in those. And also, there's there's quite a lot of people believe that if they, if they, um, they, they can If they don't get the results that they thought, they can just blame the fact, well, I didn't realize that it was 72 grams of oats and not, and not, you know, 70. And so those two extra grams of oats are the things that stop me from winning, actually. They don't want to take responsibility. But really, how people win $20,000 or $10,000 or $5,000 or any of the prizes that we're offering in Buns and Guns is by following the nutrition plan 100% not letting themselves off the hook with the cardio. Doesn't matter how tired you are. Doesn't matter what time you get home. You fucking get on that treadmill and you do your cardio. You are stronger than life is tough. You are. Nobody cares. Work harder. That is what will get you results. That is what will get you to win the prize money. Not obsessing over the tiny details that do not need to matter, that do not need, sorry, for you to stress over. They don't matter. Don't distract yourself with stressing over the minutia. Get yourself focused on what's important. Do the cardio. Do the strength training to the best of your ability. Train to failure. Stop beating yourself up. Stop making excuses. Prep your food. Eat your food. Get enough sleep and focus for eight weeks. You have the opportunity to be paid 20 thousand dollars for eight weeks work. Some people get paid, you know, an average salary in the, in the United States is $40,000 a year, $40,000 for 12 months work. You have the opportunity to be paid $20,000, half of an annual salary for eight weeks work or $10,000 for eight weeks work or $5,000 for eight weeks work or 3,000 or 1,000 or 500. And even if you don't get paid, you will come out of the end of the eight weeks with discipline, determination, consistency, drive, and a fucking spectacular body with improved health and fitness. You win and you develop a belief in yourself that you did not have before. That is what you win at the end of a competition like Buns and Guns. That is why my shreds are so successful. They're successful because they're hard. If you follow it 100%, which very, very few do, you will get phenomenal results. But I have to make my shreds hard enough that if you only follow them 50%, 50 to 60% of the time, which most people do, that you'll still get good results. Most people who purchase fitness programs either don't even start them or don't finish them. And the ones that do finish them usually give it between 50 to 80% of the effort. 50% 50, 50 is average. So if you follow the program 50%, you will get 50% of the results. If you follow it 100%, you will get phenomenal results. 50% will get you good results, probably better than most fitness programs on the market. 100% will get you phenomenal results. And you will develop a belief in yourself that you absolutely did not have before. So how do you win a program like Buns and Guns? How do you get the best possible results? You follow the plan the best way you can. If you have to combine cardio, fine. If you have to do it fasted, fine. If you have to train fasted, fine. If you have to eat, if you have to do your cardio after you eat, fine. If you have to do the homework inside of the gym workout one day, fine. If you have to combine the workouts one day, fine. Just do what you can. 
Do the best that you can. Be as prepared and as planned as you can. And if something goes off, something happens one day to knock you off track, then so be it. Don't stress over it. It won't matter in the long term. What matters is con- consistency, not perfection. Consistency trumps perfection every single time. The more you stress, the worse your results will be. Try to always do more than is recommended. What, what I write in the program is the minimum amount that you should do. You should try and take the stairs when you can, walk when you can. You should try and put in an extra couple of runs or walks. If it says rest day on a Sunday, do you think I would be taking a rest day if there was a $20,000 prize at the end of it? Absolutely no. I'd be getting out for a walk. I'd be getting on the treadmill. Anytime I felt I could do more, I would be doing more because I would be focused on that 20,000 prize, but I wouldn't be focused on controlling the tiny variables like how big is a handful of blueberries. If it says a piece of fruit, does that mean a whole piece of fruit or just a slice of fruit? These are real questions that we have every single time inside inside a competition that we run. Don't stress, okay? Don't focus on the tiny details. They do not matter. Focus on the bigger picture. Remain consistent and above all, accept that you will not know what is possible in eight weeks until you fucking try. If you've never done a shred before, you have no data. Go into it with an open mind, right? Go in with an open mind. Let's see what your body is capable of in eight weeks. Have a goal in mind, but be realistic that you may not reach your goal because it may not be in reality because you have never, ever done something like this before. So you have zero data. So everything you are doing is a hypothesis. (sighs) So just accept the what is. Try and have fun along the way and don't stress because you know what, at the end of the day, It's all going to turn out okay. And I'm going to run another shred with another epic prize. So if you miss your shot this time, don't worry. There's another shot around the corner. And at the end of it, you're still going to get an absolutely epic body. And that is that. So how did you enjoy that one, eh? This was really specifically for people who are competing in Buns and Guns. But if you're listening to this, well, actually listening to listening to this at any time, you can purchase the Buns and Guns program. It is for sale at any time. Simply go to thesculptedvegan.com, go to our programs page. You will find it there. Um, or if you're listening to this before May 26th, 2021, you can absolutely still join the competition. Um, all you need to do is go to the website, purchase the program. All the details are sent to you. And if you're inspired after listening to this, thinking that you would like to get paid 20 grand for eight weeks work, then we are waiting for you because only about 10% of people who ever join my programs actually finish and submit photos. 10% consistently, 10% finish. And I would say of the 10% that actually submit photos, only about 10% make it through the first cut because most people don't even look, many people don't even look like they've actually done any work. And that's the honest to God's truth. You can tell instantly the ones who've done the work. Whenever I go through the the photos that are submitted for competition, on first glance, I can go, she worked, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't. Oh yeah, she worked, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't. I know, I'm an experienced bodybuilding coach and judge and competitor. I know immediately who did the work and who did not. You cannot fool the judges. We know how hard it is to shift fat and build muscle. And we know who's done the work and we know who hasn't done the work. Um, And so I really hope that you join the competition. I really hope that you give it a shot because the group is amazing. It's so supportive. The coaches are wonderful. They're in there every single day. And it's just such a fun environment to be part of a shred. So guys, this was awesome. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I will catch you next week for another episode of the Kim Constable podcast. Don't forget to leave a review on the podcast wherever you're listening to it. Um, And I hope you have an awesome rest of the week wherever you are. Um, I love you so much. Love that you're listening. Um, I love connecting with you every single week and I will chat to you next week for another episode. So have a wonderful week and bye for now.